You may have heard of Maxwell's demon. Maxwell believed that if you had a box and the thermodynamics, it's kind of wild because sometimes the heat flows from not just from hot to cold, but from cold to hot. If you have a box filled with gas and you put all the gas over on one side, usually, almost always, if not more so, it'll flow from hot to cold. Sometimes, though, there's a slight, slight probability that it will actually flow from cold to hot. So Maxwell believed that if you had this demon, well, elf, and you had it with a trap door, and that demon finds those molecules that are headed its way, opens the trap door, lets through the ones that are hot, and separates the heat from the cool, then basically you've got the heat flowing from cold to hot. And this could be used as a source of power. This is based not only just like on thermodynamics, but also on the theory of information, because they're trying to prove that Maxwell's demon really would always work. And so they say it takes a certain amount of information also to do the computing, it's always going to take less information to do the computing than it does to make it flow from hot to cold. In science, we've seen other situations where scientists make elaborate proofs and evidence for things that are supposedly quite well proof, like sociobiology, where they go out in the field and they were measuring this or that chipmunk or, or um, beaver, and they were seeing what was going on and putting in these very big books, you know, books three inches thick about sociobiology. And more recently, they found that altruism is not about gene selfishness, like sociology says, but rather about efficiency. Altruism is about efficiency, and this improves efficiency, and this seems to make good sense. Other elaborate scientific uh, events have been about like naming all the clouds. They have different names for them with scientific names. These have turned out to be totally not founded well. No, not the Federated Association of Foundations. And I think this idea about Maxwell's demon is about the evidence of the definition and so the other way around, and consider compression. If you have cooling and slower particles in the box, faster sensors, and the computers, you can have a total success of Maxwell's demon. This is a limit method because below a certain speed of the particles, and as the sensitivity in the speed of the chip increases, and the efficiency like the trap door increases, you reach a point where it's beyond that amount. I think this is not as a limit of thermodynamics, but of computation, because you have a finite problem. There's a finite energy of the particles. It takes a finite amount of energy to react with them to find where they are. And given enough speed of computation, you can overpower that finite amount. One way we could do this is by increasing our sensors. Recently, sure enough, they've taken light and electrons and combined them. And so now they have a sensor that has properties of both the light and the electron. Beyond a certain energy, of course, Maxwell's elf would fail because the light is going to slow and the molecules are going to fasten the box. So it would take more and more computation to solve it. You may ask, what about uncertainty, quantum uncertainty? Wouldn't this make it so it would always radiate out more than you could ever find to radiate inward? You may have heard of the famous Bohr-Einstein debate where they're both talking about the uncertainty principle. And Einstein said uncertainty was improbable because you can imagine a small box, you open it, and out radiates the quanta. We can close it tight enough that before it radiates out, you can find out what's going on about it. And Bohr, in retort, he says, the retort report, he says that gravity would close the box, so there is no quantum uncertainty there either. If you think of uncertainty as just like radiant outward randomness, both these arguments would still be against uncertainty. Einstein was a Spinozan. He believed that everything in the universe, if you have a set of particles, and you know the initial state, and you control those particles well, you can control all the events that happen. That's all that ever will happen. Einstein's cosmos is completely deterministic. Einstein also believed that if you had a low energy quanta, you send it into the usual quanta we find around us already, and this low energy quanta would get around the quantum uncertainty, and then you could know what's going on. So with this, there's no problem. Actual low-energy quantum experiments show that Einstein was partially, at least, correct about this. They used a cat like Schrodinger's cat in the box, which turns out to be a quanta. What else? And they send the low-energy mouse, another quanta by, and see how the mouse acts to see if there's a cat in the box. And these experiments are a partial triumph, it would seem, for Einstein's idea. I mean, why spend a fortune on expensive shades? Just stay in the shade wherever you go. I thought of the Higgs laser. This is an idea that the low energy Higgs, which they've recently found, 
might be valuable to use a monochromatic Higgs ray, the Lindry Higgs ray, to sort of achieve what Einstein was hoping to achieve with his idea about the low energy quantum experiments. The Higgs laser would involve, as I say elsewhere, a tube of usual quantum that would have waves that move like the waves in the arena where someone is now collecting on royalties on it. And while you really can reflect the Higgs, probably because it wraps around the quanta, you could actually at least increase its coherence by making the waves of the quanta in the tube, so that as the Higgs goes down that tube and is removed from the quanta somewhat, you have it so they get more and more coherent. Then you have a coherent Higgs ray, and you can do some interesting, really valuable things with it, I think, perhaps. And this is the Higgs laser. So here I ask, if you took the Higgs laser and you know how the quantum is about to collapse, and you know at each phase of the collapse of the quanta, you send in that laser and it changes all those Higgs particles inside the quanta, also the Lundy Higgs. And as they collapse, you control how it's going to collapse in the wave function to then re radiate back out what quanta you want. So this would be sort of a way of controlling all the events as Einstein believed, if it was so. But a quanta is with waves between these Higgs derived from gravity. I believe that gravity has overlapping changes in both wavelength and speed as determined by its acceleration. Relativity is the opposite of gravity because gravity pulls you down to oneness. And relativity is like thermodynamics and speed of light, so it radiates out to many. They're sort of the opposite. So by this, uniform motion, which relativity controls quite well itself, is based on the unchanging speed of the light. It changes only its wavelength. But gravity would change both speed and wavelength because of its acceleration. By my definition, gravity is nonlinear. And all the quanta around us may be frozen gravity that would be created in the black hole by the irradiated inward implosion of the field to the point where it starts to re-radiate. And then those quanta unify and spew out the jets. And that's the source of all the mass around us from that one point in the universe where mass is more easily converted to energy inside the black hole and energy to mass all around us. So the attractive component of the quanta around us, especially that holds the quanta together or they would explode, it's made of something like gravity. It's changing with its speed and wavelength for coherence to hold the quanta as unified. Steven Weinberg, the physicist who helped build the foundation of SU3 with the strong force method, he asked, why is Schrodinger's equation totally non-random and classical if there's all this randomness from like decay products, where's all this randomness from? And this would be from gravity because gravity is nonlinear. By nonlinear, we mean non-predictable. This is why you send in like one probe into the quantum to get out five unpredictable results. So if we took the Higgs laser and by the Spinoza method of Einstein, we send in the Higgs to change the collapse as it, as it takes place and we have complete control of the quanta, and voila, Einstein's method wins. Like Einstein was the one giving GPS instructions where to go. But if you compare this method of Maxwell's demon to Einstein's method, it allows Maxwell to win, but Einstein not so fast, because gravity has negative entropy. So waves and particles in the quanta where you have both the Higgs quanta and the accelerating waves, Unlike Maxwell's method, meaning you can have sides, and it's linear, so we imagine it's quite possible Maxwell's ELF allows machines that indeed allow using the air to generate power. Yet for the quanta to completely control all the interactions by Einstein's method, would always take more energy put in than you receive for doing so, at least from the strict point of view of energy itself. Einstein believed time doesn't exist, he was saying to von Neumann in his letter just before he died. From Einstein's point of view, relativity tells us that space and time are unified. And so if you can reverse your motion through space, you can expect to be able to reverse your motion through time. But of course, it doesn't do this. This lady says to me the other day, there's nothing wrong with her that her own ATM machine could make cheaper. She says she only says it's because she has my interest at heart. And lately, that rate has been 67%. Others like myself and British physicist George Ellis believe Time is asymmetrical and powered by the collapse of the wave function. It's theoretically reversible, as Einstein said, but other than in principle, it has the huge drawback of needing negative entropy and huge energy and huge machines to achieve it. But this idea that gravity is how the quanta are held together by a derivative force 
because of the nonlinear acceleration of the gravity, the gravity wins out with the collapse of the wave function. Because of the three principles that I believe are foundations of everything. The first principle is the foundation field, whatever it is, it always has more traction than the re-radiance. The second principle is beyond a certain point, it's going to re-radiate after it radiates in. And the third principle is no infinities are allowed. So for gravity and all the quanta and all the fields, there's to be more holding it together than radiating out, or it wouldn't exist. George Ellis says the collapse of the wave function causes time to exist. Einstein says time is reversible. George Ellis says, right, Mr. Einstein, you go to the future and reverse the time, or you go to the past, and I'll see you in 1987. It will be in a month, and they're having a celebration all around. If uncertainty is derived from gravity and the collapse of the wave function is much faster than light, and time will be reversible by special relativity, as Einstein believed, because in special relativity, light is a quanta, quanta is a particle, this reverse is spin, it's spin up, spin down, it's time reverse. It's a little clock, it spins in reverse. If the Earth is more privileged than the Moon and the more at rest, and the Sun is more at rest than the Earth and Moon, in terms of gravity, then gravity is not relativistic as Einstein believed. As I say elsewhere, I believe the proofs of general relativity, which are all about changes in acceleration, can't be derived from the relativistic theory that masses fall at the same rate without changes in acceleration. So all the proofs, like the bending of the starlight, frame dragging, the shift of the helium and the mercury, they're all about changes in acceleration. Yet Einstein says that they fall exactly the same rate at different masses. So it's cool to say the Earth is rushing up at 30 feet per second at the same rate as those masses are falling downward. And we have to ignore that by F equals ma, the heavier mass moves slower with the same force applied. If you increased its mass and its inertia the same amount, for every mass you increase, you apply the same force, they move at the same rate, even though they were different masses. Why does gravity operate supposedly vertically, but not horizontally, the force? And this would be because Einstein was assuming what he was trying to prove about gravity, because if you raise two masses to the same height, they're different masses, you use different force to lift them, and when you drop them, they do fall at the same rate, but they release different amounts of energy. In truth, you can set them so that you use the same force, and they rise to different heights, and they fall at different rates. Just as the Earth and the Moon fall at a different rate around each other, just as with force equals ma. Please see my next video up about why I believe gravity may have two speeds, if LIGO is not a hoax. When at the inertial speed, at the speed of light, since Maxwell and Einstein believe gravity and inertia are essentially the same thing. And another much faster component, like the collapse of the wave function, which is instant, and at all points, by my generalization of Maxwell's other method, based on the force between the masses. Much lighter force, maybe much higher speed, you lighten up to travel faster. Well, time for me to go burn up the road. I'm not on a low-fat diet if I wear elevator shoes.